Um, so coming up now, we're going to have our MDT session. So I'm going to be introducing two of my colleagues, so two genetic counsellors, who um, one of which I work with directly, which is Samantha Mason, and also Stephanie Oates, who's working at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And we're going to do a review of some difficult cases. So these are based on some cases that are uh, similar to what cases I've been through, essentially. And we're going to talk through them and think about how they would handle each of the cases. So it's a bit of a sort of like practical session um, with a few different practical and ethical dilemmas in it as well. Feel free to add comments in the chat as well, and we can discuss a bit more at the panel session as well. Um, so if Sam and Steph want to put your cameras on, and then I'm going to share the cases. Can everyone see and hear that OK? I can, yeah, I can see, see that. Fabulous. So thank you for coming along, Sam and Steph. Um, because I have my screen, full screen, I can't actually see you, but I can hear you. So we can all talk together about these cases. So I will say that I gave you these cases in advance, so I'm not completely throwing you in it. Um, so you've had a chance to think about what you would do in these scenarios. Um, but I don't think there's a particularly easy, easy answer in these two scenarios as well. Um, so we can have a sort of, there's no right or wrong. We'll just have a think about how we would handle them together. So I'm going to go through the cases first, if that's OK with you guys. And, um, and then we'll talk it through. So this first case. Um, we have a young boy. So we have Robbie here. He's 12. He's very well. No particular health concerns for himself. He has a father with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so Stephen, he actually had a cardiac arrest and that was the first time he was investigated and found to have the condition. And that cardiac arrest was witnessed by Robbie. Um, so since then, Stephen has been treated with a myectomy and a defibrillator. It was a really distressing experience uh, for Robbie. He was visiting Stephen in hospital when he was really unwell. And um, Robbie's now developed a phobia of hospitals um, after this really traumatic experience with his, his father. So Stephen has now had genetic testing for his hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we found a pathogenic MYBPC3 variant. And the first time that you're sort of in touch with Stephen is the discussion about testing for Robbie. So Robbie hasn't had any clinical screening because he refuses to go into the hospital or have any scans. But now there's this possibility of genetic testing for Robbie. Um, you have a chat with Stephen on the phone. And he says that he really wants Robbie to have the test, but he's been through so much with uh, his own heart problems that he would like to do the test for Robbie, um, but not tell him what the results are because he doesn't want to worry him. So what are your th first thoughts when you hear this case? My first thoughts is that my heart sinks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have had a very similar case myself, actually, Ellie. Um, it was slightly different in the fact that the the person who had the cardiac arrest died. Mm -hmm. um, and the parent who survived was uh, was quite open with the children. And we sort of were able to have a very full and comprehensive discussion as a family with just the kids. We had four sessions in total. You know, we took our time and worked through all the issues, etc. So yeah, it, my heart always sinks a little bit when parents say they don't want to um, tell the child. <laughs> uh, and it, yeah, like you say, there's there's no easy answer, but I I think it requires a lot of careful discussion, and I certainly wouldn't rush into anything. So talk me through that, Steph. Why is it that your heart sinks when Stephen says that? What are you thinking about? Um, I'm thinking that the child, particularly where I work now, I guess the child is my patient. Um, I don't want to lie to the child. I don't want to be complicit 
um, however you want to term it in, in, in this. Um, uh, I want him to be able to trust me or the health services as he grows up, particularly obviously if you did do the test and he was gene positive, you know, what then, etc. And of course he might be negative, but um, he still needs to know that. <laughs> and, and I guess I, 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 I think that, you know, it, it probably is usually, it's very understandable a parent um, saying that, particularly, um, you know, given what, what they've both been through. Um, but I think it's usually unprocessed grief that um, needs working on um, first. And, and although, you know, anecdotally, um, I have a fair bit of experience in this, there is also some research that says, published research that says, you know, very clearly that I think that children um, respond better when they're informed, obviously in an age appropriate manner. Um, it's more beneficial for, for their relationship with us. It's more beneficial for the family relationships um, to not tell them it can do more harm than good. And obviously, if you're thinking about ethical things, you've got to think about not doing any harm, <laughs> trying to do good, etc. Um, so, yeah, I, it, my heart sinks in it in a sort of maybe facetious way. because it just I think it just means there's a lot of work to do with with the family and in um, you know, that can obviously be quite difficult and one of the things I've always kind of um, thought that there's a difference with, with genetic counselling as opposed to um, what people more commonly term as therapeutic counselling is that they obviously sign up to that where, whereas people don't necessarily sign up to counselling in this and, and you, you know you can have um, you can face quite a lot of resistance in trying to work through things like this. Yeah yeah exactly the I wonder if, you know, if we spoke to Stephen about this, he'd say, well, actually, you don't know Robbie and I do. And I know what's best for my son. Yeah. Um, that's a, yeah, that's one of the thoughts that popped into my head when you said that, Steph. Um, I'm wondering what's your initial thoughts, Sam? I think very similar to, um, to Steph and that, you know, you see this case and, uh, you know, instantly thinking, oh, gosh, what a dilemma. Um, and I agree with with everything Steph's you know said so far, and that you need to work through the family. And and um, I think that was one of my thoughts when I read this in terms of a sense of if we, I never want to lie to the child. I always want to be open and honest. You know, we're in a slightly different situation at the Brompton where we look after both the kids and the adults, so it's a perfectly real situation that both the child and their parent will all be my patients. So I don't want to get the parent on the back foot and, you know, ruin a relationship there as well. But I also want to protect the child and look after their needs. And, you know, I also thought, um, was thinking about, uh, like Steph said, the importance of letting um, kids know early on, we know it leads to better outcomes. You know, the earlier you tell them these things, the more informed they are about it, um, you know, they get used to it. So I think those were all of, you know, very similar thoughts to um, to what I had as well about the, the case. So from a practical perspective, you've just had this quite concerning phone call with Stephen. What is your next step? You Are you going to meet with the family? Would you want to meet with Robbie's parents or with Robbie himself? Would it be in the hospital, over the phone, video call? What what do you think would be a good next step in this case? I think a good, for me, a good next step would be meeting both Stephen and, um, and Robbie's mum. If I can see though on the family tree, they're split up. So maybe that might be a delicate matter, but you know, I think both parents need to be involved in this conversation um, uh, and to see where they're coming from and what their fears are and you know talk them through things and I think it would be quite a good place either to do it in the hospital or or over video face to face would be better but I also understand sometimes it's very difficult to get people to come in you know all the way into London just for a conversation um, and now we have these video tools which is, is can be quite useful um, so I'd want to get the family, you know, the two parents together and discuss things in a lot of detail. Robbie wouldn't have to be present for that conversation because I think that would be a, a conversation just about what the parents are feeling and things like that. And then moving on from there. What do you think, Steph? Would you have the same approach to meet the parents first before meeting Robbie? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, exactly like you said, Sam, now we've got video technologies that I've generally found um, people feel quite comfortable with now um, and that, you know, can enable them to be um, in their own own environment, um, you know, so perhaps more comfortable and um, happy to open up and talk about things than perhaps coming into to a hospital, uh, particularly for him. I don't know if he, he may have also some dislike of hospitals, understandably, given what he's been through. So um, either face to face or, or video, however we could do it. But I think definitely you need to have a discussion with the parents first um, to sort of you know, talk through, like you said, Sam, the, the, all the concerns and issues that you have. And um, I try and be quite upfront with parents um, and, and sort of, you know, say that, you know, this is not usual practice. There's some ethical dilemmas about this, but also not to be per prescriptive or telling them, you know, what, you know, that you know their son, better, <laughs> what's better for their son and stuff. And just sort of saying, look, it's not a case of we can't, we're not going to test him. It's just, you know, when and how and um, trying to work out what's best for, for everyone um, and kind of, you know, maybe back it up with some either uh, simplified explanations of research or, or experiences you've had with, with other families and, and just to try and be, you know, facilitate an open discussion about it. OK, that's that sounds like a really sensible plan, actually. Um, so just thinking if you've had that chat with the parents um, and they still say that they will not tell Robbie the results, would you do the genetic test? No. <laughs> Sam? No, also no. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't proceed unless they were going to tell Robbie and I would want to be present for, you know, telling the results or at least have a be present telling Robbie or, or something like that um, to make sure that it happened um, after this situation. Yeah, so this is a sort of simplified version of something that actually happened to me so I'll tell you how this happened in in real life and I don't I'm not that happy with how I did it but it all came out okay in the end so um, I had a very similar case to this family they didn't um, want to tell this and their results he was actually already booked in for cardiac screening so he was supposed to be having an MRI in the hospital and he lived really far away and so what I said was I will meet you at the MRI and we'll talk about the genetic test and he can go for the MRI at the same time and in the end the little boy didn't really get involved in the conversation at all he didn't say anything he was so scared um, but I was happy that he was in the room and hopefully got a bit of the information that we were talking about so it wasn't a secret but he wasn't really involved in the decision or the discussion and then the bit that I feel bad about is that he was so scared he couldn't actually have the MRI and we took the blood sample and he was negative for the variant so I thought I've dragged this poor little boy into the hospital um, to have this scan that he didn't need and he's negative so um, it all worked out okay in the end but I think the approach now we have the video call technology and everything like that I think your guys suggestion of talking to the parents initially perhaps over video because they live so far away would be a good start and then involve Robbie in the discussion thank goodness yeah. he was negative <laughs> yeah I know when he came back negative wow it was great <laughs> it was great news because yeah. I thought this poor boy he's too scared to have the MRI and if he comes back positive he's going to need to have them in the future and it was just a really impossible situation um, any yeah go ahead Steph I'm sorry I'm interrupting Sam oh Sam right go ahead oh um I was only going to say that you know my also some of my thoughts about we've got lots of families who possibly it's not about a genetic test in terms of keeping a secret but we've got um lots of adults who we know who don't even want to tell their kids that something is wrong um or why they're coming into the hospital uh we've got lots of parents who are maybe a slightly in denial that it's genetic um, and that their kids need to be screened. So I'd say maybe, you know, these cases where there's a bit of um, secret keeping around wanting to do the genetic test, uh, you know, don't come along too often, but I'd feel in the cardiac world, um, we've got lots of patients who keep, you know, keep their own diagnosis a secret from their children um, and uh, don't pass on the information that they need to get screening. And that happens quite a lot. 
So I guess mm. it's a similar ethical dilemma um, for our service as well that I guess we deal with quite a lot. Yeah, you're quite right, Sam. There's so many instances where just information isn't being shared in different forms and it's causing risk to other people. And I think, yeah, the way I often think about it is time is on your side in that sense, because sometimes I think, Steph, you're mentioning about grief and often there is is grief to manage and shock and fear. And when people are able to work through that it, and we are able to have sort of multiple conversations, sometimes we are at the point where we can start sharing information. But then I guess the thing that's against our side with time is that people are at risk and they've not yet been informed and they should be being checked. So it's this really difficult balance, but we can be at, in an almost impossible scenario with families when we're trying to share information, but also manage people who are in an impossibly difficult situation as well. Um, any last comments on this case? Um, I was just going to say, I don't know if all services have access to these. I think they maybe don't, but um, we're quite lucky that we've got some psychology support and some um, really good play therapy support to help in this sort of scenario. Obviously, more so perhaps with the play therapists if they come into hospital, but um, I, I've certainly found that that has been really helpful and that's helped um, in, in a perhaps maybe a more indirect way sometimes with dealing with grief and secrecy and stuff like that. So. Very good point, Steph. And actually, play therapist exactly would be would have been great, probably for Robbie. I don't know if he saw one before he had his MRI, but yeah, he was a very scared little boy. So, okay, that's been a really interesting discussion. Thank and you can, both. Can I ask yeah. a quick question? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask because you know I don't deal with minors myself, but um, this must come up quite a lot. You know, this thing get this where parents want tests for their children but don't want to tell them and, and there must be precedence or medical condition on this kind of thing um because you everyone has said that if if it came down to it and the parents wanted the child to have the test but they said they wouldn't give the child that you wouldn't do it are you actually able to say that you wouldn't but if the parent says i know my child best um i want them to have the test because i tell the child yeah, I, it's a really good question. I think legally, I don't, as far as I'm aware, Steph and Sam, please tell me if this is wrong. I don't think there's anything legally that can say you can't do something without telling your child because Robbie isn't at the age of consent, so it would be his parents who are consenting. So I believe they would be able to do that. Um, but it's just we have to think in the best interests of the child and weighing up the the risks and harms of that and that's why we wouldn't well we would prefer not to do it or at least delay the decision until the, we've had more discussions but i don't think there would be a legal precedent for that as steph and sam do you agree yeah, I mean, it's tricky with his age, because obviously if you're getting to 14, 15, 16, you can talk about Gillet competence and, and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, obviously there is not not legally binding, but there is, you know, some uh, evidence to say things, you know, like the child should be involved to give their assent, even though they're not giving their consent and, and things like that. And this is all part of the reason why as well, I would say that it's not a case of no, they can't have it. It's just when and, and, and how we do it to sort of try and smooth that out and parents don't always see the, the subtleties in that but um i mean as far as i understand you know obviously with an, with an adult it's kind of it's assault to take a blood sample without consenting them properly but with a child i guess they technically could um it's not something i'd want to be part of though and yes you could say that uh, they could go and get it done privately which unfortunately i think they probably can um and you, you do still want to keep that relationship and have that um, uh, conversation, keep it going. But yeah, again, I think I would just have to go back to what you said earlier about you know, the child's best interests and, and not compromising my professional standards. Thanks. Thanks, Steph. Um, so if there's no further comments, we could discuss more in the panel discussion. Um, we'll move on to the second case. So. Um, We've got Wendy here. So her dad, Harry, has passed away. He had dilated cardiomyopathy. He had genetic testing previously, 
which showed a pathogenic lamin variant. Wendy, Clive and Thomas have been referred to you for predictive genetic testing. You get a phone call from Moira, which is the wife of Harry, um, before the appointment in a panic. And she says that Wendy is attending this appointment because she believes that Harry is her biological father. But actually, Moira was pregnant with Wendy when she met Harry and they got married. So it's been a secret her whole life that that Wendy has actually got a different dad um, and no one actually knows about that. She's really worried that a genetic test, if we do a predictive test for Wendy, will reveal that Harry is not her dad. She's an extremely religious woman. She's not told anyone this except for her priest. And she's experiencing a lot of shame about her secret. And she said she was so terrified that the secret may come out from the genetic test that she may end her own life. What is your first thoughts on this scenario? Again, I think it's a, you know, heart sinking scenario in that, um, you know, somebody's saying they're almost suicidal um, over what might happen. You know, they're clearly not in a good place about these things. Um, you know, and then and then what's your role in all of this? You know, Wendy's your patient, Moira isn't your patient. Um, and I think my heart sinks a little bit at the thought that, you know, I wish Moira hadn't told me anything because then I wouldn't have known <laughs> any different. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't have come out. Tell me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think I'd probably be, my heart would sink that Moira tells me all this and I would just, just think, oh, you if you hadn't said anything, we wouldn't have known um, any of that. What do you think, Steph? Yeah, same. I mean, I think, um, again, you know, obviously Moira is not my patient, but, you know, it's a very important thing she's told me. I think I would want to have a conversation with her, you know, to expand that, whether it was over the phone or, or face to face, whatever she, you know, wanted to kind of go through her concerns in more detail. Um, uh, it's the toss up again between do no harm, do good, etc, isn't it, about um, what is the greater harm? I was thinking about that, you know, um, is it more harmful to um, test Wendy, you know, a blood test, a period of anxiety that's completely unnecessary, um, or is it more harmful, you know, when, when I personally, I, I think Moira's um, re revelation that she might kill herself is the greater harm. I think, you know, we know that Wendy is going to be negative. And if I had to, you know, to cut along working through Shaw, I think I would probably test Wendy. And obviously reassure more with that, um, you know, it's not going to reveal, the, you know, information about her, her biological father. Would you test Wendy, Sam? Yeah, I probably would. Like like um, Steph said, going through the do no harm and, and things like that. At the end of the day, you know, we're not going back into that family, you know, relationship. Wendy and Moya are the ones who are going to have to live, you know, um, and live with that information. So I don't want to break down those relationships and possibly cause, you know, extreme harm to Moya if she's, you know, going to um, commit suicide. Um, but, you know, equally, Wendy might be anxious about this you know, test result and, and things like that. So I might even be trying to rush Wendy through the testing so that she's not in that anxious period for a long time because we know it's going to come back negative. Um, so I might rush that through a bit quicker than I would normally just to, to relieve that anxiety, I guess. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Just thinking about Wendy and the harm that this is potentially doing to her in terms of the predictive test, but then also weighing up the harm that could happen if she finds out that Harry wasn't her biological father. Do you think we have a moral imperative to share this information with Wendy now that we've been told it? I think that's playing, not God, but do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> playing Jeremy Kyle more like, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, ugh. That's, uh, that's, I mean, I was thinking I've had a not too dissimilar case from this um, very early on in my career where a dad told his 
three children that he might have long QT syndrome and at least two of his children were very interested in genetics. They were like 14, 15 learning it at school. Um, and then he told me that actually he wasn't their dad. They had a sperm donor because he he, he was infertile. Um, and I was like, why did you tell your children this? <laughs> if they were really interested in genetics you know and I, I felt slightly differently with them at that age because um I think they were at my I felt you know that they were at an age where it could still be information that was they something they could accept and, and you know we had a very long discussion and I felt like a family therapist who was not quite qualified to do that but um uh, that did work out very well in the end. In the end, he ended up telling them and they were absolutely fine. Um, however, Wendy is 30 and um, she's dealing with the death of someone she thought with his dad. It's a different situation. I think, you know, the older you get, the, the more difficult it is to perhaps accept that information and amalgamate it into your life. So, yeah, it's not, not an easy one either, but... <laughs> <laughs> and um, so if you, you know, you said you'd speak to Moira, what would you, what would you tell Moira? I, I, I guess I just want to have a more therapeutic chat with her. I wouldn't, you know, focus too much on the condition or the, the genetics as such, apart from obviously addressing her concern about the biological aspect of, of the testing and whether that would reveal it. Um, but I would want to sort of just, you know, say, I would want to hear you know her story how how she's feeling how she came to that decision you know um maybe talk about secrets and how that there's been keeping that secret for her how, you know if it came out from from another perspective how might that feel trying to learn a bit more about wendy and their relationship wendy and harry's relationship the kids and i guess just trying to get a, a, a background sense i mean you could say that's just me being a bit nosy but i think um that could that can help you figure out the best way to do things I think. So I think we're all on the same page with this one so this actually happened to me and it was very stressful and um, I did the same thing that you guys said you would do so I tested Wendy. Um, I decided that it would be the least harmful thing to do so Wendy came back negative and that was it. I did not say anything of what Moira had told me and what happened was um, Moira then called me again afterwards in a panic and said are they going to check the blood type from the genetic testing could that show something is it any because she just couldn't believe that the genetic test would not show anything and I just had to con you know sort of reassure her and um, and that was it after that second phone call we didn't speak again um, so yeah, this is one of my more challenging cases. So um, that's both of the cases. Thank you both for talking those through. I think it's been um, a really interesting discussion. I will stop sharing my slides now. Um, I've been a bit blind because I have not, I've had my screen on full screen, so I haven't seen if any questions have come in. Um, but Avas, I guess we're going to go to a bit more of a general panel discussion now. Um, about the cases, but also about any questions about the talks we've had already. Um, do you want to start us off with any questions or any questions from the chat? Um, there, we haven't had a lot of questions. I've been keeping an eye on the chat actually. Um, so, uh, can I uh, just a quick question for Brian? Are, are you using um, uh, any? Are you using things like um, Mavacantum? Clinically. Uh, Super, thanks, Alice. Um, so, um, as, as far as I'm aware, it's been given a kind of, well, a restricted license by the FDA in the US um, to specific hospitals. It, it hasn't been granted a license from the um, uh, European Medicines Commission or the MHRA, so we don't have access to it. Um, in, in clinical practice, um, we're just about to start a trial, hopefully in non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, so I think yes, the only access we have to myosin inhibitors is through clinical trials at the moment in in the UK. Right, and then anything on the horizon for um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? 
Yeah, so yes, so um, not that yes, not that immediately springs to mind. Um, so so I, I, I think the answer is that yes, there probably is. Um, but uh, yes, I suppose I'm less aware of, of things. Uh, you know, I, I think it'll there'll be very early clinical trials of anything, nothing kind of phase two or phase three yet, I don't think. That is just a fascinating uh, era, isn't it, to be involved in, in heart muscle diseases? Um, with these. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We have a question in the chat from Lima. Um, she asked whether I would consider a psychology refer or we would consider a psychology referral for Moira. Um, you know, I actually didn't consider that at the time. I think I was so worried about the secret coming out. I kind of wanted to minimize as much interaction as possible. I was like, you've told me enough already, Moira. Um, but I did worry about her and I really, really felt for her because she was in so much pain and the, the thought of someone keeping that secret their whole life and having that much shame about it, it really broke my heart actually. Um, she had told me that she'd spoken to her priest about it. So I felt reassured that she'd at least got some support there from the church. Um, but no, I didn't. I think just because I wanted to keep it as simple as possible in such a complicated scenario, I didn't consider that for her. But I think, Steph, you did mention that that could have been something to explore because clearly she was having a lot of psychological harm from this. Yeah, it's, it's a hard one there again, isn't it? Because um, they, whilst I am not a religious person really at all, I think that is something that can come along with religion. Um, and so it, I wouldn't want to pathologise that because it's understandable, I guess, given given why she's feeling that way. But I think that would be part of my reason for wanting to have a conversation with her, at least whether it was face to face or, or virtually, just to you know see if there was any support needs that might be helpful or useful to her. Yeah. Um, I also had a question for Brian, if that's all right. Um, so I was just wondering, I know you spoke about some of the um, medication treatments that can be used to, I think it was a Mavacamptin for HCM. I was just wondering, is there any sort of plan to do a sort of preventative treatment for gene carriers? Is that on the horizon? Would they use Mavacamptin for that? Or is it a bit of a grey area because they're not actually affected affected with the disease? So, so uh, uh, yeah, super question. And I think that is the holy grail in that, you know, we want to prevent disease. I, I think the problem from doing that from an industry point of view in a clinical trial is that the event rate, you know, of patients developing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, is quite low. So what do you pick as your study endpoint? Do you wait for patients to have clinical events and then we're going to need, you know, tens of thousands of patients to follow them up for a really long time? Or do you pick a, you know, a, 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 a softer clinical endpoint like the development of clinical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And then we'll probably still need thousands of patients and years of follow up. And that's really expensive because of the, the um, you know, because the way industry run clinical trials. So uh, I, I think there are lots of reasons why that's going to be a really challenging thing to do. But, I, you know, uh, my opinion is that I don't think that should stop us because, you know, it, it's it's the most important question from our patient's point of view. And, you know, there's the potential for the largest impact. I, I think it's just it, 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 it's a difficult question to answer because of the logistics of, of doing clinical trials. And I think the focus will be put on other areas to begin with. Um, but yes, I, I think it's it's the most important question. I think, uh, Brian, I know I know how you said how much you hate um, or don't like mice models. Um, this reminded me of um, uh, some a study from about ten and years ago, I think, of um, PKP knockout mice, where they uh, basically ducked them in water and got them to swim, force swimming, and they developed the phenotype quicker. Then they had a, a group of the mice that they used offloading with with diuretics and it slowed down the progression of of the um the phenotype you know the theory being that it's the reducing the stretch on the desmosome so so yes yeah, so, you know simple thing that um uh, did show to be effective in a, mi a mouse model at, um retarding the progression of the phenotype 
Yeah, so I, I think that's the only mouse model I've ever shown in a slide. But but I think I think the reason I showed it because it, it has kind of, you know, transformed the practice or, you know, hopefully has transformed the practice of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and it's really, you know, it, it was really elegantly done. So, you know, I think there's a time and a place and we have to interpret them with a pinch of salt, but some of them seem to work. <laughs> We have a question in the chat. Um, I think it could be relevant to Matt or Debbie um, if you're still around. Um, can you briefly comment what would be the major challenges in developing genetic cardiac testing panel? Question from Anis Atha in Cardiff. Um, hmm. Well, I mean lots, but I think the important thing constructing a panel is the original gene curation. So I think historically, I remember when we used to test, we had a big ICC panel and we used to test all sorts of genes, find variants which we couldn't actually decently associated, associate with the disease because there's just not the evidence of the gene disease association. So you really need to start with a good firm gene disease association. And we we realise there are genes out there which are probably causative, which just haven't had the work done yet. And that's why that's why things always change. So we we kind of review our panels once a year ish and sometimes decide to put genes on, sometimes decide to take them off. So, yeah, I think it starts with a good gene disease association um, and we're. <sighs> You need to be careful. Obviously, the more you test, the more you'll find, which you might think is good. But all we end up doing is just producing endless variants of uncertain significance, which in the fullness of time might turn pathogenic. But yeah, you need to be careful. So yeah, the short answer is a good gene disease association. And then possibly just good bioinformatics afterwards. So it's it's not just about developing the panel, but how you're going to interpret the variants and filter them, I guess. Yeah, sure. And so, we need to be aware. I mean, there's lots of typically panels have been tested as the coding regions plus a few splice site intronic regions, but increasingly we're finding certainly with genes like mid PC3 that there's loads of deep intronic variants which are definitely causing disease that haven't been tested yet. So I know in our lab we've started putting some intronic sequences on for some genes and I think that's going to raise diagnostic, um, increase the diagnostic yield, you know, a few percent, but we've we've solved at least 10 or 20 cases which even a year ago you just wouldn't have found those variants. And I guess whole genome sequencing theoretically might help with that in the future um, with caveats because there's always a caveat. <laughs> I guess I'm thinking as well, if the panel is really big, you've got more of a chance of finding something incidental that's not actually relevant to the phenotype as well. So you've got to keep yeah, it totally. wide yeah. enough to capture what you're testing, but not too wide. Like I'm thinking like hemochromatosis carriers and things like that, that coming back on DCM panels. Yeah, and things. yeah. Totally, and we get a lot of, obviously we get a lot of CF carriers appear on our big bronchiectasis panel. I know that's not cardiac, but same concept. So there's, yeah, there's kind of gu vague guidance around when you tell someone they're a carrier and when you don't, but it's, it is hard, yeah. And I think, yes, yeah, definitely incidental findings are a massive issue. Can I ask um, a question, um, Matt? In terms of genetic counselling, um, you know, we still in, in Cardiff, you know, we still up until recently anyway, or most of the cases we refer through the genetic service and, and they are seen by genetics and counselled. And um, so I'm increasingly now just starting to just do it, do it myself um, and just send the patient, you know, do do a sort of do the counselling. If it fits the test directory, then send the patient for bloods from from clinic. It, what what? Uh, are you guys still involved in most of the cases? You know, if it's um, or, or do do your clinicians do some of it, do a proportion of it themselves? Sam, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, I'd say for Ellie and I, we're involved in most of the cardiac genetic testing. I'd say the vast majority um, of the genetic testing, and it's 
slightly better in terms of then the cardiologist can obviously concentrate and and talk about you you know their heart disease and their clinical outcomes and things like that and then we have a separate we make a separate appointment um, with the genetic counseling team uh, and go through everything then and I think it's nice for the patients to have a breather because we used to do it all on the same day and I feel like I'd call the patients up with the test results you know months later and they'd be like do you remember that we did this and they'd have absolutely no memory of of anything because the day was just so massive um, and so much went on and so much was talked about. Uh, you know, I don't think there's too much of a problem, I guess, with cardiologists doing the initial, you know, the consenting and things like that. But I think where genetic counselors are really useful is the results, um, uh, explanations and things like that, because that often is where a lot of the work is created. Because, you know, if we find something, we need to contact all the family members and explain it to them. And then I often have other family members contacting me and asking how to get referred in. So I feel like that's where, you know, and it's nice, you know, if we start off with the consent and, and making that, I guess, you know, that um, relationship with the patient uh, rather than coming in just at the results and um, is, much, is much easier for us um, uh, in terms of then we know what's been explained to them. We've had a conversation with them about what, what's happening and, and hopefully it's much smoother process for them. Yeah, yeah, I, and you know, I agree, and I, I 100% agree that you know you guys are, are so much better at um, a lot of those things. Talk, you know, to the patient and explaining things, and how you know taking time to do things properly. I think in in Wales because we didn't have a lot of access to genetic testing until recently, and then we adopted the the test directory a few years ago, and so our our um, access to genetic testing has gone up massively, and. And it's having a huge, you know, positive impact on, on what we're doing and how we're managing patients. But um, I just feel sometimes our genetic service can be overwhelmed because because we're referring so many more patients. Um, and hence it can be it can take quite a long time, the whole process of, you know, from referral to results. Um, but yeah, I agree. I agree. Definitely. You guys do do a lot of it much, much better than we do for sure. We've got some comments in the chat. I think different regions do different things. So uh, Sarah Gibson is saying in Devon and Cornwall, they have a similar model to yourself, Abbas, that the cardiology colleagues are doing some of the consenting now, but then the positive and the US results are referred to clinical genetics. And um, Liam has also said that there's different um, models and that as a cardiologist, if you're confident in interpreting the results, then you can do that. And I think you're quite right that, unfortunately, uh, we always say how great genetic counsellors are, blowing my own trumpet, but we're also a very limited resource. And I think a lot of hospitals don't have enough to actually um, get enough patients through the testing. And a lot of the cardiomyopathy panels, for example, will be negative that come back. Yeah. And perhaps that is something that could, um, you know, go through the cardiologist and then the positive and the VUS results go through clinical genetics. So I think that could definitely work as a model. Um, but yeah, I think centres uh, di differ in, um, in sort of how they offer this service. Um, yeah, Lima is saying that other people have difficulty accessing genetic services. I think that uh, some of the talks we had before about the provision of the um, NHS genomic testing directory is hoping to remedy some of those issues of access, but we've still got a long way to go. So I'm hoping talks like this will spread the word and we can get better at the mainstreaming of um, genetic testing for ICCs in the future. Yeah, I certainly. Have. Oh yeah, no, just very quickly. I was discussing a case with Nabil, you know, earlier, who's of Tommy's, and um, you know, someone that had come in under his care with um, a syncope um, and an MRI that was suspicious of lamin, but a normal ejection fraction. So they're thinking about putting an ICD before the patient left the hospital if lamin was positive. Um, and you know, that's I first heard about this rapid um, genetic testing within a week, and you know, it's. I'm blown away that that is happening because in a, you know we're we're two and a half that mile sorry two and a half hours down the M4 but we may as well be on another planet when you hear about things like you know one week genetic testing it's incredible so there is still you know huge variation in access across the UK to to genetic testing and genetic services. Mm -hmm. If I can just add the value of the genetic counsellors as well for all the family testing, you know, that's where the clinician can get the result back and he's able to pass that on to his patient. 
but then there's the whole family to look after and that's where I think the genetic counselors are lifesavers to the clinicians um, in the clinics and, and where it's so important. Not that I completely appreciate that's not all you, you people want to do and obviously it's nicer to be in from the beginning, but that uh, just in the Brompton, um, we've seen how grateful all the clinicians are to have the genetic counselors to be able to um, counsel family members, sort out the testing um, and feedback the results. So that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah and I think, you know, like whilst in an ideal world, every centre would have their own dedicated genetic counsellors, you know, we know mm -hmm. that's not happened just yet, but um, I think it, 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 counselling is not just about the information, is it? It's about how they interpret, deal, you know, after effects of it as well. And I think if you do or can have access to, to dedicated or <laughs> you know um, genetic cancers then that can really help smooth things out in the long term but I know you know the health economic arguments don't always hold weight. <laughs> I have a quick question for Debbie and Matt and you might not want to answer this <laughs> but, but how quick can we go for a diagnostic panel? So we, we see reports in New England Journal of you know whole genome sequencing being done in very very rapid time in the states for you know for neonatal diagnoses and things. Um, is it is it foreseeable that we could match that type of speed? You know, in the case like Abbas says, where you know we need to put a pacemaker in someone with complete heart block, and the genetic test will you know will decide whether they have an ICD or a simple pacemaker. Is it possible to do that within 24, 48 hours? It depends. At the moment, yeah. So it depends about theoretical, and I mean, I know. People in America quite often there's a new world record and they did it in X amount of days. But you know that that was one case, a big research lab with 48 people with their pipette aim. So theoretically, if you had one sample and five people working on it, you could whack it through really quickly. But in the real world, when you've got 250 samples a month in a lab of 10 people. It doesn't work like that. I think the world record in our lab, we've got one out in 11 days. But That's, if, yeah, it depends on the technology. If you yeah. still read it using the short read sequencing technology, there's a minimum time that it takes to do a library prep sequence and get the results out and analyzed, which could be done in a day. Um, the rest, there's a minimum, absolute minimum, I would say, of 11 days or something. But that might change with long read sequencing. Yeah, that's, so I think that's the promise. Yeah, I think the fastest yes. the fastest NGS service in the UK is the Exeter Rapid Exome, which is a 14 day turnaround, and they're really good at doing that. And I think that's a massively resourced, well run people with people who are really good at stuff. And that's still, I don't know, 14 days sounds really good to me. It might sound really short to other people. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, as usual, it depends on resources. Sure. Thank you. Matt will be wanting you to work. Nice yeah, well. I'm just trying to excuse yeah. our long turnaround times here. Yeah, yeah just <laughs> work 24 hours from okay. now on, OK? OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're reaching the end of our time today. Um, thank you so much to all of the speakers. I think it's been a really interesting morning and afternoon. I've definitely learned a lot about sports cardiology that I didn't know about and also about genetics as well so and the audience have been really great in participating with um comments and feedback as well so thank you to everyone that's joined or anyone who's watching this um on the recording I don't know if you wanted to say anything else Abbas no no it's been really great likewise I've learned a lot a lot about genetics and um and yeah it's been really good it's been good really uh, good present great presentations good discussion and um yeah thanks to everyone Thanks to those that stayed on till the, the bitter end on Friday evening as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go have a glass of wine now, I think. Sensible, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Ellie, Ellie, for organising everything so well. No problem. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> have a great weekend. Bye. Okay. Bye.